Okay. Okay, let's, so let's start with a little bit of review, just so we know where we are. Um, we're trying to understand the behavior of, oops, the behavior of large networks of neurons. These are neurons, connection by axons. And the weight between neuron I and neuron J is WJI from neuron J to neuron I. Um, and in the first couple of lectures, we described dynamics um, using the equation tau dVi dt. Tau dVi dt, uh, linear integrating power neuron minus dI minus dj, so e leak minus the sum on j of w i j g j of t times v minus e j i minus e j. So this is the first equation we wrote down. We, this is a conductance-based model. Um, we turned it into a current-based model. I remember g j is um, if this is time and these are spikes on neuron J, it's just a little PSP every time the spike arrives. Okay. So that was what we worked, um, what we spent the last first several lectures on. And the goal was to understand the behavior of the system. Um, now we're going to take a step back and look at what behavior system given a set of weights. Uh, we considered pretty simple weight structures for which we were able to do analysis. What we want to do is, step, is take a step back now and ask how, what, so how are these weights, so what does a weight mean in, um, for neurons? Okay, and remember from last time, um, we took this term here and we called it G I G I J. Let me put a bar over this, xj of t. And xj of t was, was um, basically the, what was triggered when there's a spike. So xj of t, um, or xj obeyed the dot, the equation xj, x, sorry. The equation x j dot equals um, some function of neurotransmitter concentration, which I'll get to in a second, times one minus xj um, minus beta xj. And basically it was it was alpha of c, remember, versus um, well, first of all. So C of T looks like this as a function of time. When there's a spike, um, C goes up. So this is a spike. And then alpha of the function of C is some increasing function. So basically when there's a spike, um, X is pushed toward one. When there's a spike, when there's no spike, it's pushed toward zero. And Um, so that's that's kind of the story. There's something that that um, so there's something that we that I sort of slipped into all this analysis, um, and that is that that um, the reversal potential 
here only depends on the pre type of the presynaptic neuron, and GJ also only depends on the type of the presynaptic neuron. And that's due to something called Dale's law. Um, so, and then there's sort of two pieces to this. So Dale's law um, basically says, so I, we have to take, take a step back and look at the synapse. Synapse looks like this. I'll draw a big one. Um, that's presynaptic. That's postsynaptic. Um, this is filled with vesicles. Um, and inside the vesicle is a neurotransmitter. So Dale's law says the neurotransmitter depends on the presynaptic neuron. So each presynaptic neuron has one kind of neurotransmitter. So what that means is that, um, so, this, so somewhere back here, remember, is a neuron, okay? Um, and so if, if we had a different, if we had a different, um, Bouton from the same neuron. So from the same neuron, in that case, it would have the same neurotransmitter. Same neuron, it would have the same neurotransmitter. So these would be, um, these would be the same, these would be the same. Okay. And the reason that's important is it's because to a large extent, well, with an exception, um, the neurotransmitter de determines um, the characteristics of alpha and beta. And basically, it, it, so it de uh, determines two things. So the neurotransmitter determines, so this is actually true for inhibitory neurons, exactly true. So the neurotransmitter determines, actually I'm gonna do one more translation. Um, and so we, the key thing that we, that we, that came out of all this, if you remember from last lectures, is these two quantities or alpha and beta So alpha of C and beta, the characteristics of these, this determined, so alpha, where does I put this? This determines rise time. and beta determines the K time. And you remember what happened is when there's a spike as a function of time, you basically get a rise and a decay. So this is tau decay. And this is tau rise. Okay, so, the, so the, the decay time and the rise time are determined by alpha and beta and um, for inhibitory neurons, neurotransmitter determines uh, tau rise 
tau decay and reversal potential. Okay. So if you know what neurotransmitter is, you know the characteristics of, of the dynamics of the synapse. Um, and in that case, it makes complete sense for this thing, for the reversal potential J and uh, the characteristics of, of the conductance to depend only on, um, on J. Okay, and that of course, again, comes from Dale's law, which Dale's law said, same neuron, same neurotransmitter. For excitatory neurons, the situation is a little more complicated. So I actually forgot to tell you this last time, but the neurotransmitter is glutamate. Same glutamate found in monosodium glutamate, um, but tau rise, tau and tau decay. So, so epsilon j is determined by. Let's add a page. So epsilon j, the reversal potential, is determined by um, by the neurotransmitter. Okay, so all excitatory synapses have about the same reverse potential, but tau rise and tau decay are fast for AMPA and slow for NMDA. Okay, and so um, when we write Write our equation like this, that actually is a good model um, having sort of this, this only the J dependence here is a good model for inhibitory synapses. Um, and, but this is a note of warning for excitatory synapses. Um, for excitatory synapses, if you want to do realistic modeling, then WIJ should really be replaced by WIJ AMPA, GJ AMPA, plus WIJ NMDA, GJ NMDA. And what that corresponds to um, for the postsynaptic uh, neuron, I'll just write here. So you have pre and post. So pre and post. So you can have in the postsynaptic neurons, you can have um, multiple receptor types. You can have on the one hand, um, so these red ones are AMPA channels, let's say. And you can also have NMDA channels. Okay. So they have both AMPA and NMDA, and they're independently regulated. And in fact, NMDA regulates AMPA, as we said. Um, so that's, that's sort of an explanation of, so, so that's part of the way. So when we talk about, um, when we talk about what we mean by weight, we mean sort of two things. Weight's a little more complicated than just a number. Well, um, so there's one more complication when it comes to weight, and that is um, when a spike arrives, if you recall, um, sometimes there's release and sometimes there's not. Okay, so the last thing, ingredients that goes into weights are uh, 
Okay, failures. Um, no synaptic release. And so um, if PR equals release probability, we need an IJ here, okay? Um, that synapse, 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 the synapse of neuron I from neuron J, then the actual weight WIJ is something like a GIJ bar PR IJ. And this is this is this is an approximate description. Because as we saw, um, the release probability goes up and down. It goes down when they're, when they're well, goes up from calcium, goes up because um, when a spike arrives, there's calcium buildup. We talked about this last time and it goes down because of the uh, vesicle depletion. So when we say what's a weight, it's kind of, it's not really in neuroscience all that clear. Uh, the synapse is, is highly dynamic and time bearing. Okay, that's just something to keep in mind. Um, we don't know how important all of this is. Um, I'll talk a little bit about recurrent, recurrent neural networks later. And what you'll see is multiple time scales are important. Um, but, uh, but what this is used for is, is, is not clear. Okay, so that's kind of background. What I want to do now is, um, so this is, so far we've talked about how synapses work uh, in the brain. What I want to do now is switch gears and talk about synaptic plasticity. Okay. Um, and we're going to consider NMDA dependent. Well, then consider first NDA dependent. Make sure I spelled that right. Uh, plasticity. Okay. Um, and we're sort of, but I'm going to generalize it to all sorts of different kinds of plasticity. Um, we use NMDA dependent as an example. Okay, if you remember from, from last lecture, um, remember from last lecture, um, NBA channels are different. So I'm actually going to draw a big picture so that we really have a good idea. So I'll put. As usual, pre and post. Okay. Um, and we'll consider an NMDA channel here. Actually, I think I want more room. I'm just going to look at the post synaptic side. Okay, focus on the postsynaptic um, side of the synapse. It's got some, um, in this is NMDA channel. And remember, because there's a magnesium block, um, the current. Um, is equal to G bar X V minus E NMDA, which is around zero. 
divided by a voltage dependent term, one plus the concentration of magnesium. The reason that's important is because magnesium tends to block NMDA channels over 3.57 nanomolar times EXP of minus V over 16.1. Um, and what that means is that, as we saw before, so this is um, ENMDA, which we can take to is equal to zero. Um, the actual current is if there were no magnesium, it would look like that. So this is the case. Um, so this is the case where, okay. so magnesium equal, if there's no magnesium at all in the bath, you get something like this. By the way, if you take magnesium out, your brain goes apoplectic because there's too many spikes. Um, but when magnesium is included, uh, this is, we'll put this around minus 65. Um, the current actually goes up and comes down. So basically what I plotted here is, is, is I, NMDA current. Okay. Now what we're going to do is use this curve um, to infer how much calcium comes into the cell. Okay. So part of the current So current contains calcium. Which is sort of a universal signal, signaling molecule in the brain. And how much calcium comes in determines plasticity. Okay, and what happens is when calcium comes in, influx of calcium causes, um, and so, so influx of calcium causes insertion or deletion of amphichannels. Okay. Uh, which means that the, the weight changes. So we can actually write down um, as a fun, we can write down the change in weight, delta W, as a function of sort of um, calcium, calcium influx. So this is the total calcium that comes in when it's presynaptic spike. Um, and when calcium is zero, um, you typically get no change at all. And then if there's some kind of curve, um, it usually goes down and then it comes up. So small amounts of calcium, so small calcium influx, leads to depression. The weight decreases, whereas large calcium influx leads to um, potentiation. Okay, and this is pretty typical. You can't you can't have only increases in weight, or the weight will definitely get too strong. You can you'd also have only decreases. Um, the weights will be become too weak. So what we want to do now? So so um, what this says is so this is a coincidence detector. Okay, so if you basically had a bunch of presynaptic neurons, 
and Mrs. Post, PreSynaptic Ethics Spikes. So um, these are a bunch of spike times. And the postsynaptic neuron, um, also a bunch of spike times. So the relative timing of these spikes will tell you um, whether it's potentiation or depression. So for instance, um, if you have a spike that, so a spike right that, that comes right here, which is not close to either of these two, um, there, the presynaptic, spike in presynaptic neuron is what causes the voltage to increase. Okay, if the presynaptic neuron doesn't spike, the voltage stays at about minus 65. Um, so the voltage stays right here. This presynaptic neuron doesn't spike, and so there's very little NMDA current. Okay. And so the timing of these spikes is going to matter. If the presynaptic neuron fires and the postsynaptic neuron fires right afterwards, um, when the voltage tends to be high, um, that's when you, you're going to get potential changes in synaptic strength. So what we're going to do is, is actually consider two spikes. Um, so we're just going to consider, oops. Two spikes. So this is a presynaptic spike, spike on a presynaptic neuron, a spike on a postsynaptic neuron. And this dip will cause this difference to be, So the question we want to ask is, how much calcium influx, influx is there as a function of delta T? And once we know how much calcium influx there is, we can ask how much is the weight change as a function of delta T? So our goal for the next uh, couple of slides is to compute the weight change as a function of this timing difference. Okay, so that's gonna give us a, a plasticity rule that depends on time. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is, so we can do this in steps. So question, what's so what's delta W, the change in weight as a function of T. And we can do that in steps. Step, step one, uh, what's the voltage? At the synapse. Um, two. What's the calcium influx? And three, um, what's delta W? So it's a fairly complicated process, okay? Um, it's gonna come several steps. Um, each one isn't so hard, but you have to get all three of them straight to actually get, a, get an understanding of, of what the change in the weight is. And so the last thing I want to remind you of before we do this is, is what a backpop gain exponential is. So here's a neuron. That's it's a dendritic tree. Okay. If you look at the voltage in this neuron, so if you plot the voltage versus time, and there's a spike. So the spike leads to um, and then there's a spike, what happens is the voltage, the voltage uh, 
uh, propagates into the axon. I'm the worst speller in the world. Uh, into the dendrite, sorry. Okay. So the voltage in the dendrite is a function of time. I'll draw it on the next slide. Um, so this is, um, so we'll label this. This is time, this is T3, the time of the presynaptic spike. And this is T post. Which is probably better to draw this thing here. This is T post. Okay, so if we plot the um, the voltage we plot voltage versus time. And we'll have this be T3, time of the presynaptic spike. Um, and so really this is delta T, right? Um, well, I think of the time since presynaptic spike, this is voltage. So this is minus 65, um, it propagates, it comes up and it comes down. And the time scale here is on the order of approximately 10 milliseconds. Okay, 10 to maybe 20. Okay, so the voltage only stays high. Um, so 10. Okay, so the voltage can can um, kind of decay out into the into the um, So there's a little bit of increased voltage um, up to around almost maybe 30, 40 milliseconds, but it's not that long, okay? So that's the voltage. What we wanna do now is plot the calcium influx. So remember, if you go back to our NMDA channel, um, the voltage is sort of the, the NMDA current has this shape. Okay, so at really low voltage, um, the current's low. At really high voltage, the current's low. Somewhere in between, it's kind of high. Um, and so we can map, what we want to do is map from this picture and now plot um, what we really care about is calcium. Influx. So I'll do that in red. So the voltage is in black. In red, I'm going to put calcium influx. Um, and this is actually, so this is T pre. Um, so we met, well, actually, let's go back to this. So remember X, this variable X here. Okay. Um, X itself has some time dependence. So remember X of T for NMDA channels, X of T. Last for kind of a long time. It goes up and down, and it can last for on the order of 100 milliseconds. Okay. So that's pretty important because that means that um, we now look at delta T, the presynaptic, the postsynaptic neuron, let's say the postsynaptic neuron fires here. I'm going to erase this in a second. This is the time of the postsynaptic neuron. What you're going to see is basically X goes up and comes down. Um, and it actually, we could probably even make it longer. Because it um, goes up, comes down for a long time. Okay. 
So what that means is you can actually have the presynaptic neuron fire before the postsynaptic neuron. And this region here, um, this green region, this is where you get um, calcium influx. Okay. So this is X post of T. So this X of T is exactly the same as um, this X of T here or this X of T, okay? So the idea is the presynaptic, the postsynaptic neuron fires, um, the NMDA channels open or they'll, well, the X, the, the channels open. Um, they're still blocked by magnesium. So the channels, so the channels open here. That's where they open, but they're blocked by magnesium. However, um, they stay open for a long time. So even in here, they're no longer blocked by magnesium as in calcium influx. Okay. So if we plot now calcium influx, oops. I'll do it in green. So we plot on this axis. Um, I'll put delta T here. So again, we'll have, this is delta T equals zero, time in the presynaptic spike. Okay. So the calcium influx actually um, starts low, goes up, Sort of peaks somewhere over here and then goes down. And it peaks at, you probably draw a better picture. It peaks at, let's say, around maybe 20 milliseconds. Somewhere to the right, peaks over there. So this is CA influx. Okay, so this is how much calcium goes in. Um, and finally, that's gonna allow us to do what we really want is, um, I think it's here. So the calcium influx, if it's above this quantity, so this is um, delta W greater than zero, and over here, delta W less than zero, okay? Um, and so we can put some, we can put that threshold in. Um, and let's say we put it in, let's try orange. So this is a threshold. This is our CA threshold. And that corresponds to, we call this here, CA threshold. Okay. And what that means is that um, over here, you get, so in this region here, the weights go up, in this region they go, and in this region, and this region they go down. Okay. So our last plot should be, um, Actually, I'm going to draw. I'm going to draw the axis centered here. So this is delta T equals T post time of the postsynaptic spike minus time of the presynaptic spike. Um, and the way we've drawn it, it's actually negative here. Um, so it looks like this. Goes down, some value, goes up, some value, then dips down and goes like this. Okay. And of course the details matter. If you if you put the calcium threshold high or low, you get different shapes. Um, but it's kind of interesting. So here, this is pre before post.
okay? And this is pre-after post. Okay. Um, and this, of course, is uh, this region here is, is pre way after post, but let's ignore that. But this looks this looks causal. Um, if we're up here, what it says is, if we're in this situation, um, so in situation where first the presynaptic neuron spikes, this neuron spikes, and then that neuron spikes, uh, the synaptic strength tends to go up. If it had been the other way around, if the if the postsynaptic neuron had fired first and then the presynaptic neuron had fired, you would have got depression. Okay, and so this is this is sort of based on on what we expect, given what we know about the biophysics of uh, NMDA channels and uh, NMDA conductances. And so, what do they find experimentally? Um, so experimentally, this is more or less exactly what they find sometimes. So basically if you do experiments, I'll put the reference, I think the reference is actually on my web page, but if not, I'll put um, the input. And I'm not sure when that was, it must have been in the 1990s. So what they found was kind of exactly, this was actually in tissue culture. They found a curve that looked amazingly like that. Um, this was, so this is, this is T-post on this axis, T-post. Minus T free. And the time scale here was around, this was around 40 milliseconds. So if the if the if a neuron spikes, a presynaptic neuron spikes and the postsynaptic neuron spikes, within about 40 milliseconds, you'll get potentiation. On the other hand, if the postsynaptic neuron spikes within about 40 milliseconds of the presynaptic neuron, um, you get depression. And this has been, um, since then, there've been a lot of experimental verification for this. Um, and in fact, this is called STDP. Spike time. Dependent plasticity. What if you think about it as an odd name? Because so spike time STDP spike time dependent plasticity um, refers to this particular shape, um, but in fact, uh, so this isn't always what's found. There are lots of things that are found. Sometimes there's, um, it's not exactly, it doesn't have this causal shape. Um, so it's not uncommon to find um, a situation like this where um, even when the presynaptic, uh, the postsynaptic neuron fires before the presynaptic neuron, you get Let's put on this axis, it's the delta W, the change in weight per pairing. Um, you get something like this, and you can even get inhibit inhibition. Um, you can get things like this, um, which is something you might want to inhibit during neurons, and you find all sorts of things. Okay. And there are also something I won't mention, they're actually nonlinear effects, um, which well, I'll mention in a second. So you can find just about any shape you want. Um, this shape here is generally is sometimes called the Heb rule. Um, so Heb rule, the Don, Donald Heb um, postulated, I think in the 50s, that if neurons fired together, their synaptic strength would increase, sometimes called neurons that fire together, wired together. Um, 
So you can find all sorts of things in the brain. Um, so this, this STDP is, is not a, it's pretty common, but it's not universal and you can find it. Um, this can be shifted in various ways. You can imagine um, for different neurons, these might be shifted somehow. Um, so, so you can find just about anything, anything. Okay, so what we wanna do now is look at the implications of this. For plasticity, um, we're gonna write down learning rules and look at, uh, figure out what that means. Um, we're gonna write down learning rules in terms of buying rates rather than spikes. Um, and let's take a five minute break and I'll do that in the second half of the lecture.
Okay, so what we want to do now is look at the implications of this for the way. Basically, what we'd like to do is is write down so what we want. Um, well, it's, it's, I'll back this. Go back to what I want to do, and then I'll explain it. Okay, so we have two presynaptic. Instead of just considering a single pre and postsynaptic spike, we'll consider lots of spikes. So this is pre. So each of these we'll call TJ. TJ is a time of the J presynaptic spike. This is post. And these are our spike times. So these are TI. And what we want to do is um, the total change, the change in weight, delta W. is the sum in IJ in some region of K of TI, TJ minus TI. Where K is this kernel. So this, this here, and this, so this is K, it's basically this shape. Um, or it might have something like this. And actually, write it down explicitly so this is totally clear. So, for SDDP, for instance, a um, bit of an aside for SDDP, the classic curve. So, K of tau equals, um, so it's got two terms um, K plus E to the minus T over tau. Sorry. E to the minus tau over, oops. Divided by tau plus, for tau greater than zero, and plus k minus e to the minus tau over tau minus for tau less than zero. Okay. And so if you go back to this curve, this would be um, this point here would correspond to K plus, and the K here would be E to the minus, uh, we'll call it tau over tau plus. That's the Ks. And this point here would be K minus, and then the K here would be E to the E to the plus, tau over tau plus, some exponential decay with tau now going backward in time. So I need to put a plus here. Okay. So that's what I mean by the kernel. Some function of time, um, it can have it can have this shape um, here, um, you know, this shape here, or it can have this shape here, this shape here. It can have any shape we want. So we're gonna write down something very general. Okay. So one more thing, when we write this as a sum, this is known as so this is, so because we're doing a sum, this is a linear plasticity rule. Okay. Um, and linearity means that it doesn't really matter when these spike times come. So, so for instance, the fact that you, you might, might, be, might be the case if you get two, two spikes in a row, they don't really have the same effect as the sum of two individual ones. Um, and in fact, linear plasticity rule does break down. Um, there are other effects, there are nonlinear effects. Uh, when, when spikes tend to come close together, the plasticity rule is different, but it's not a bad approximation. And it's what we're gonna use to consider now. Okay, so what we wanna compute, um, so this, of course, you know, we could run simulations. We could figure out what, how, how the weights change. Um, but we want to get a little intuition for how this works. So we have um, delta W. Actually, this is going to even be delta WIJ, but we'll put that very often. It's a sum of IJ of K of TI minus T, TJ minus TI. So we can write the average delta W. 
And the average is over many different spike trains. And so first of all, we'll do one more thing. We'll assume the spikes. Um, so to compute the average, so assume spikes are Poisson. Shorthand for Poisson, Poisson distributed. That means um, probability that probability of a spike, let's say, let's say a pre spike between times uh, T and T plus delta T is new pre delta t. Okay, so the longer the interval, you're more likely to have a spike and it's and the probability of spikes independent of everything else. And we'll assume for now, so first pass, so new pre and new post, are constant. So the firing rates are totally unmodulated. They're just the same, but the pre-synaptic spikes, but the post-synaptic spikes. Um, and given that we want to compute the average value of delta WIJ, average over spike trains, what's the averages in the world? The average value of this where the average is over spike trains. So if you did lots of experiments with lots of different spike trains, um, and this is basically the average value of K of Ti, right? Which is really, if we call this interval delta T, so this is integral dt, D delta T, uh, P of delta T, K of delta T. Okay. Um, maybe you want to divide by, by some time concept, but something like that. Um, and if these are Poisson spikes, basically neurons, they're spiking completely independently. So P of delta T is a constant. Okay, which means that the average change in the weights, delta W I J is equal to, is basically equal to the constant. And that's it, it basically, it's, it's integral D delta T, K of delta T. So it's the area under the STDP curve. Um, and it turns out, I mean, this isn't so important, but we can write, it turns out that DW, D, 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 average value of WIJ DT um, Average value of the time derivative is equal to uh, new pre times new post times integral d delta t of k of delta t. Okay. Um, and so that basically means the weight just in, keeps increasing or keeps decreasing. It just changes linearly um, and depending on what you have in here, so for instance, if this is, so perfectly balanced, which is equal area, um, implies integral of d delta t, k of delta t, 
equals zero. So if you have balanced SGDP, the weight doesn't change on average. And the weight doesn't change on average, but under um, this assumption, okay, the new pre and new post are constants, which of course isn't really correct. Um, and the reason is, let's actually make a whole new page. Um, so if we go back to our picture, here is, oops. This is time, this is our presynaptic spike. Actually, just let's put one. So one presynaptic spike and one postsynaptic spike. Um, so after the presynaptic neuron fires, so the presynaptic neuron, it's really the presynaptic neurons are causing the postsynaptic neuron to fire. Okay, so the fine way of the presynaptic neuron, the postsynaptic neuron, new post, is equal to, um, let's say, new post, new zero post, and plus the sum on J of Wij sum function H of T minus dj, okay? And what this means is, so remember j is, these are presynaptic. Spike times, in fact, so these are presynaptic spike times, and H of H of tau looks something like this. This is zero. It basically increases for a short time and then goes down. Okay, and it's also modulated by the weight. And the idea is um, when the presynaptic neuron fires, it actually affects the postsynaptic neuron. And so what you get for the postsynaptic firing rate, if these are the times of the postsynaptic uh, presynaptic spikes. This is pre, so new post, you know, it goes along and the pre postsynaptic, presynaptic neuron fire goes up a little bit, goes up a little bit, okay? Um, and so that's super important um, because what it means is that when we um, take this average, so um, the average value of K of Tj minus Ti um, is equal to sort of the integral D delta T K of plus T times um, the H of delta T. And then there's a W out here. Um, H of delta T plus new, new post. Let's see, hold on, let me make sure I did this correctly. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this, and basically, so so this and K of delta T, of course, we're only picking out um, positive lobe. Actually, I want to write that there. So what this means is, so here's K for the FTDP curve. 
Okay, looks like this. Goes down, oops. Goes down a bit like this. And H looks like this. Um, you know, goes up, goes down, something like that. And so this area under the curve, green, basically, when um, the, the, it's more, what, what's that going on is it's more likely to have a spike. So really, all this is saying something different. After presynaptic spike, something sort of very uh, intuitive. Um, probability of a post synaptic spike increases. Okay. And that means you're more likely to have a pair of spikes. Um, you might like have a pair of spikes on this side than on that side. Okay. And what that means is that um, the equation for, for sort of the rate of change of the weight of the average weight, WIJ, UT. So we have a usual term, you know, new pre, um, and then new zero post times um, integral d delta t, k of delta t, and then plus some other term, wij, we'll call it average wij, um, and then just some, some number we'll call epsilon. Okay. So dropping these averages, just to, to make things easier, we can write down an equation. Um, dwijdt. I put a bar over there so it's less writing. Equals um, some constant. Let's call it. Uh, let's give it a name. Uh, r r zero plus epsilon wij bar. But importantly, epsilon greater than zero. Okay, so this is a bit problematic. Even if we set R0 equal, so for instance, we set R0 equal to zero, um, the weight basically explodes. Um, if R0 equals to zero, then you have um, UWIJ bar dt equals epsilon WIJ bar. Um, implies wij bar um, equals wij bar times e to the epsilon t. Okay. Um, so you get weights either, um, weights go up to infinity. And um, if the case where r naught is not zero, let's say r is zero is greater than zero, um, let's actually make R not less than zero. If R not greater than zero, you get the same thing. R not less than zero. So you might say, okay, I'm going to basically choose our SCDP curve. So on average, I get depression. And now you get um, DWIJ bar equals minus epsilon bar not. Remember, it's now negative plus epsilon WIJ bar. In this case, you get something a little more interesting. Wij bar equals, um, so asymptotically, it's going to be R naught over epsilon, um, well, more or less asymptotically, plus um, Wij bar of zero times one minus e to the epsilon t, okay? Sorry.
Jesus, Epsilon T minus one. Okay. So again, it goes off to infinity. It's got the right, it's got a bunch of constants. Um, the T equals zero, it's, oh, sorry. Um, I should be able to do this in my head. Plus, Zero minus R zero over epsilon e to the epsilon t. There we go. So that's that's a solution t equals zero equals zero. Um, for large t, it's got the right behavior. You can easily check this. Um, yeah, t equals zero, it's, it, it's every i j. And now we can write this as, um, so now we see that the sign of this, so if this term is positive, um, w i j bar goes to plus infinity, if it's negative, W bar i j goes to minus infinity. Okay, which seems kind of bad, um, but it can have its advantages. So this is actually kind of a cool rule um, in the following sense. Um, so basically, if you have this is W i j bar here. Um, so this is zero. And synapses can't go over a couple sides. So let's put, let's say, put a max here. And in between um, is absolute value of R naught divided by epsilon. Okay. Now, neurons can't go, synaptic strength can't go below a zero or above some kind of maximum. And what that means is this is an, this gives you an unstable fixed point. So um, if you move the synapses above the threshold, they go here and they eventually end up at their maximum value. Um, below the threshold, they start here, they end up at the minimum value. And that suggests a bimodal distribution of weights. Okay, and so this is, there's some evidence for this in some synapses, but it would be pretty useful. So the weights determine the network dynamics. Um, and the problem is if they have some analog values, they're gonna to tend to drift. Um, I think every protein in your brain turn out, turns over a couple months, uh, things are constantly being rebuilt and they were never rebuilt perfectly. And that gives you a little bit of drift. So in a situation like this, um, you kind of lose, um, control over the precise value of the weights. On the other hand, it makes things very stable. And if you want to change the weights and you have to kick one, kick it from one side to the other um, by going across the threshold. Um, so it takes some effort to change weights and that's actually a good thing. Um, so it leads to very stable. Um, Weights. Now, possibly too stable. There's also a trade off because um, you kind of want epsilon to be small, but then you have to fine tune this quantity. Right? It's, this scales is one over epsilon. The time it takes to get from here to here scales is um, one over epsilon. That scales one over epsilon. So you kind of want at one over epsilon about the right size. Um, but it wouldn't be too hard to sort of make a reasonable model of this. Um, it is also, so there's two, sort of two take home messages. Take, the first take home message is um, this learning rule tends to be unstable. And that's actually a feature of almost all of these kind of learning rules. 
Um, and the problem really comes down to the fact that, that, that it's this. Um, the presynaptic neurons are causing the postsynaptic neuron to fire. So assuming neurons are excitatory, if the synaptic strength goes up, um, it causes it to go up, you get more coincidences and it goes up even faster. It's runaway excitation, or in this case, if it, um, if it goes down, as it's done over here. So if it starts going down, if it gets too low, you get, again, you get run away, you get they have to be run away to zero, okay? And so basically pretty much, um, oops. So take home number two or take home, So most plasticity rules most most plasticity rules um, are unstable. Okay. And the instability can be good or bad. Um, in fact, and we don't really know which one the brain chooses. And in fact, whenever people do, um, derive plasticity rules, um, they often spend a lot of time trying to stabilize them. I'm gonna give you two ways of stabilizing, well, one way of stabilizing this one, um, you know, Mark Van Rossum. So how do you stabilize it? Um, so there's kind of a simple way, and there's some evidence, experimental evidence for this. Um, so my SCP rule, rule looks like this. So this is um, call this K plus e to the minus delta t over tau plus or delta t axis, and this is K minus e to the delta t over tau minus. So what Mark, Mark Van Rossum did to stabilize this is something very simple. Um, he put a WIJ here. Okay. So what happens is that um, when you have potentiation, it's just additive. Every time you get a pair of spikes, it adds, but for depression, it, it, it um, it's multiplicative. The larger the weight, the more it's depressed. So what that happens is when the weight gets big, so if we go back to for the simple case of, um, oops, uh-oh. Um, where is the scale on this? Shoot. Let me see. Sorry, I've never changed. Let me see. Let me see. Okay. There we go. Um, so basically, depression. So this is a depression. You can kind of make sense, right? The bigger the weight, so this keeps you from having runaway weight, weights. Depression scales with the weight. Um, and so what happens when you do the average, average of K Ti minus Tj minus Ti. So basically this thing becomes um, a sort of integral T delta T of K plus E to the minus delta T over L plus. Um, minus the integral d delta t. Um, but now there's a wij, k minus e to the minus delta t over tau minus. Okay. And this thing is equal to k plus 
uh, tau plus minus k minus tau minus times some um, wij. So our equation now becomes dwij dt equals k plus tau plus minus k minus tau minus wij. And you can even add in here, you can add in here the, the term we had before, which is plus epsilon wij. Suppose I should put bars. Um, and that won't hurt. As long as, as long as kt minus is bigger than, um, as long as, as um, so this equals k plus tau plus, minus k minus tau minus minus epsilon w bar j okay so as long as k minus tau minus is bigger than epsilon this is now a stable rule and if you include stochasticity you get a nice unimodal distribution of, of synaptic weights which is good for some things but again um it might actually be better not to have that that runaway um be able to have runaway weight things Okay, so we've got here. So this is good and bad. And this is over here is also good and bad. Okay. Okay. So so let's now leave um single complete leave single synapses again and ask, and now we're gonna ask the question, what is this good for? Okay, what are these? Or actually, it's kind of differently. Can these plasticity rules do anything useful? Okay. Um, and we're going to actually, to answer that, we're going to consider a population. We'll consider a population. Of presynaptic neurons. And one one postsynaptic neuron. Okay, so the model is going to look like this. Oops. Um, so the model is y equals the sum on j of wij xj. So we've kind of very much abstracted everything away. So in some sense, we're going to an, a model like this where we have the wij dt equals something. Um, well, we sort of characterize wij not by spikes, but by some average. So it's the average means we can think about firing rates and think of xj as being uh, firing rate. So it's a very simplified abstract model, um, but in the limit of, of small learning rates, it's not so bad. Well, we haven't done learning rate yet. We're gonna actually write, write down um, the WIJDT, or actually, let's write it. Delta WIJ, oops. So delta WIJ, so now we're going to find rate, but we're going to also consider this as discrete um, sort of machine learning samples. So we get training examples. So training examples well, 
Phoenix sort of you just basically get x x you know, x is a vector x y pairs so there's there's an x a y is computed and then the weights updated and the update rule for each pair of um, x's and y's is delta w i j is equal to eta um, y x j and there's no there's just w i right you can see easily expand this to um lots of uh lots of post-synaptic post ignorance but we can say one at a time okay so this is this is um So this is a head rule. Okay, there's no notion of time in here, but we can saw that actually that's not a bad approximation for um, in this case. So let's go back to um, the first, the simplest rule we wrote down was. Uh, this one, okay. So this is now going to be in um, in in this model. This is going to be our y post. That's our y, and this is our x. Okay. So it's got the same flavor. Sort of y is the activity to the post synaptic neuron. X is the activity to pre synaptic neuron. And we saw in the simplest version they scaled as firing rates. Um, and so the larger uh, firing rate just, or larger X here be, basically means larger presynaptic firing rate. And larger Y means larger postsynaptic. So we've massively abstracted um, from, away from a more rigorous model. Okay, we wanna know if we do that, what happens? Okay, and we can think of, of turn this, it's easy to turn this into a different equation, dwi dt. Um, equals some eta average this um, over y x i. And this is averages over our pairs. Okay, we're getting a bunch of statistics, some x's and some y's. Um, and we get something like this. Now, it's not obvious this is going to do anything useful. Okay, this is totally unsupervised learning. There's no error signal that is just incoming data, and the weights evolve according to that. It's easy to write this down in vector form, which is dw dt equals eta average value of yx. Um, but y, remember, is if things evolve slowly, is w dot x x which we can write as eta w dot x x. If the learning rate is slow enough so we can average over training examples. And this thing here, shoot. So this quantity here, This is just covariance matrix. Let's assume zero mean. So this is sigma equals covariance matrix of the data. Of the data. Okay. Um, so we're going to write this as the WDT. equals A to covariance matrix dot W. Okay, I'll quickly solve that and that'll be it. Um, now there's a classic way to solve this and that is to write W equals the sum on K 
of AK, VK, where the VK are the eigenvectors of sigma. The VK equals lambda KVK. And these are, we'll choose an orthonormal VK dot DL equals delta KL equals one if K one if K equals L and zero if K is not equal to L. Okay. So that, and the AKs depend on time. A, K, of T, T, K. So what we get is this DDT um, of the sum on K of A, K, B, K. And that, of course, is a sum on K of D, A, K, D, T times B, K equals um, eta sigma dot uh, the sum on k of a k b k equals a to the sum on k of a k sigma dot b k equals a to the sum on k of lambda k a k b k. Okay, so we have a v k on the left hand side. V k is on the left hand side. VKs on the right, or on the right-hand side and left-hand side. Um, so what we're going to do is basically, um, you can think of it any, any ways you can dot, you can use, what we're going to use is use these orthogonality relationships. So we're going to use these, okay? We can dot both sides with VL, and when we do that, we get DAL. The expression for the independent co coefficients equals a to lambda l a l. Okay, and what this rule then does is pick out the eigenvectors with the largest eigenvalues. Okay, so chooses um, eigenvector. If, if you wait a long time, well, actually, oh, one more thing. Anyhow, let me, um, we're out of time anyway. Let me stop here and I'll discuss the next time. I'll quickly discuss the implications of this and then we'll learn about, talk about ways to stabilize this learning rule. Um, and after that, we'll, we'll look at, um, well, then we'll go on to, to more realistic problems. Um, but we actually saw something and, and include, um, uh, error signal or feedback. Okay, thanks very much, and I will see you next Monday. Stay around for a few minutes if you have any questions. Uh, goodbye, Professor. Okay, bye, everybody. See you Monday.